Welcome back from lunch. How are your tummies? <laughs> you might want to put your hand on your, because we're going to be talking to this today. Um, OK, so the gut brain. So the gut actually influences the brain, and the brain influences the gut. Um, and I'm going to explain how that works. It works on many different ways, many different levels. And I want to bring it back to our work. Um, one of the most important things is that we work with the autonomic nervous system. And we're one of the few professions that can connect with that nervous system. I mean, I am a chiropractor, and chiropractors work more with the sympathetic nervous system. But we actually really connect with the autonomic nervous system, which is quite a gift of this work. And the vagus nerve is also called the wandering nerve. And look at all the different structures here that it innervates. The lungs, the heart, the liver, stomach, spleen, kidney, digestive tract. It's a powerful nerve on many, many different levels. And we're just going to talk about it with respect to digestion. So this is an important branch in, in research right now, this, this auricular branch right here. They're doing a lot of research, and we're going to talk about that right now. So basically, a woman had a really bad case of rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease of your joints. She was taking a lot of medications. She's doing gold injections and things like that. And they found a way to stimulate this nerve. And all of her symptoms and pain disappeared. So when you activate this nerve, which is a major part of the parasympathetic nervous system, you can really lower inflammation. So when you learn to regulate your nervous system, which we have to do when we become cranial therapists, um, it really affects inflammation in the body. It affects digestion, blood pressure, state of mind, inflammatory conditions. They're all controlled by the vagus nerve. One of the ways that this is measured is something called vagal tone. Has anybody heard of that, vagal tone? Yeah. So vagal tone is measured by tracking your heart rate alongside your breathing rate. And when you take a breath in, your heart rate speeds up a little bit. And then when you breathe out, your heart rate slows down. So the bigger the difference between the inhalation heart rate and the exhalation heart rate, means that you have higher vagal tone, which is a good thing. So higher vagal tone helps blood sugar. That's pretty powerful. Blood sugar. Anybody have blood sugar issues? I certainly do. I was raised on casseroles, <laughs> youngest of six children. <laughs> um, reduce risks of cardiovascular disease lowered blood pressure. You know, you can go back to work next week and just tell this to your, your clients. It's powerful. It's powerful stuff. It's cutting edge. Reduced risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, improved digestion, better digestive enzymes, also called prebiotics. Um, reducing migraines. It helps with your mood. I mean, we can all, we all know this. That's why we're cranial therapists, right? Because we love this work. We love getting, getting the work. We love giving the work because that's, this is what it does. The cool thing is that it reads the gut biome. We have a little community here called our biome or microbiome. They're our friends. We're going to learn about them today. And it reads what these little pals are doing. It kind of talks to them. So 
this microbiome can affect our mood, our stress level, and overall inflammation in the body. So when we have low, low vagal tone, which you can get easily if you live in New York City, which I did for five years, you have to really work hard to have vagal tone, as Roger knows. Um, you have a higher risk for strokes and depression, diabetes, chronic fatigue. It just goes on and on. I don't want to bring you down, so you can read it. <laughs> we, can, we can increase vagal tone. We can shift it. We can give this to people. Say, you know, oh, I just got a cranial session, but when I leave the next day, I still feel pretty amped up, so what can I do? Well, they could do some diaphragmatic breathing, take a nice deep breath into their belly. They can hum or sing in the shower, chanting, washing your face with cold water. That stimulates the vagus nerve. Uh, the meta, meditation is great to stimulate the, the vagus nerve, loving kindness meditation. And also, balancing the gut microbiome. So the gut is really important to our overall health. This is what Myrna was talking about. There's another way to measure vagal tone, which is what they do with heart math. Um, and the lower numbers are better. That's a better heart rate variability. See how the numbers are different? It's 0.85 seconds and 0.90 seconds. Can everybody see that? So that's, that's a good thing. You want that adaptability in your nervous system to be able to have that fluidity in your heart rate. The solitary nucleus is a big part of the vagus nerve, and it's located in the brain stem. So does anybody have any idea what might, what hold might really help that area? That could be, you know, an occipital hold, or if you still do it, I don't know if people do it in biodynamic, but some people do CV4s, things like that. Um, what can happen is through the vagus nerve is that you can get this this autoimmune pathogen that triggers the vagus nerve and talks to it. So you can get an autoimmune disease or issue where it's a pathogen, like a bug that's grown out of control in your gut that triggers your vagus nerve. Or you can just get an auto-inflammatory where there's no pathogen, but there's just an irritation, there's an inflammation happening that can click on the vagus nerve and activate it. So your flora is your friend, right? That's what Mr. Rogers said. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps you with food digestion. It protects you against pathogens. Now this depends on what you're eating, okay? Because what we eat, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but what we eat actually feeds different bacteria in our gut. Um, it provides essential nutrients. It trains your immune system. So it actually helps wire your immune system. An imbalanced flora is linked with disease. So it's, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about probiotics. And Myrna and I were talking about Lyme's disease because I come from the land of Lyme's and, um, you know, you, it's pretty, it's a really serious disease, so you pretty much have to take antibiotics unless you're really brave. Um, so, you know, you want to protect your gut while you're doing that with what you're eating and probiotics and things like that. So here's a picture of our microbiome. This is kind of mind-blowing because there's 100 trillion, I can't even fathom that number, 100 trillion microorganisms in our systems. 
it's 10 times the number of cells in our body. Okay. 150 times as many genes than we have. It coexists with gut pathogens. The gut is not a black and white situation. It's kind of gray. Some of the pathogens in small amounts are needed. You know, some of the pathogens make neurotransmitters that are helpful towards us. So it's not like, oh, I don't want any E. coli in my gut. It's more you want to keep it in balance. It's, a, it's just like the Earth, really. It's just a smaller version of our planet. So it coexists with these pathogens. It regulates the immune system, regulates the endocrine system. Isn't that interesting? Your hormones, your hormonal system. Uh, it modulates digestion. And it can weigh two to six pounds depending on how much beer you drink, um, <laughs> if you drink beer. Here's a chart that goes through and talks about the different connections. So if we go to one, the immune system, it connects with it through cytokines. So basically, blue is afferent, which is sensory, which is from one area to the brain. And then red is efferent, which is motor, which is from the brain to the other area of the body. So what can happen is the immune system can pick up these chemicals, basically called cytokines, and go up to influence the hypothalamus pituitary axis which is your hormones, right? The second one is that neurotransmitters are made by your gut microbiome. Do people know that? They make the neurotransmitters. It's not just us, like 50% of serotonin, dopamine, very important brain chemicals. Right? The fourth one is that the solitary nucleus at the brainstem, which is partly where the vagus nerve originates, I think, um, influences the, the hypothalamus pituitary axis right here. And then that puts the hormones out. Now, this is the mechanism right here, number six is the mechanism of stimulating the vagus nerve right here. And that affects the gut. So that's how that person who had RA, when they stimulated the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which is right in this little tear bucket, you know, when you're on a table, if you're crying, the tears fall right <laughs> into <laughs> Does everybody know that? The tear bucket? I got tears in my ears. Country Western song. So, um, <laughs> so the tear bucket is where the vagus, the auricular nerve, um, hangs out, which is a branch of the vagus nerve. So we could hold that if you wanted. You could try this afternoon and kind of tune in and see on many different levels, on the trigeminal nerve, many different levels. Um, so that affects this neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So basically the bottom line is that the connection is, it goes both ways. From the brain to the gut, through many different mechanisms, and from the gut to the brain. We're going to go into the details of this. When you take a mouse away for, from its mother, which isn't very nice, um, <laughs> I could never be a scientist like that, because I just, I would be sad for the mice. <laughs> 
Um, but you take, you take a mouse away from its mother and the gut flora gets altered because it's stressful on the baby, stressful on the baby mouse. So the other thing that can influence is stress or sleep deprivation because that increases cortisol and cortisol causes an overgrowth of bacteria. It creates an imbalance. Yeah. So an overgrowth of gut pathogens can trigger the immune system to also release cortisol. So it's like a, you get stressed, it overgrows, and then the overgrowth creates more cortisol. So it's a hard loop to get out of. So craniosacral is great for that because it can get people off that stress train, get them off that habit that they're on to be sympathetically activated. Here's a sensory connection. So this is how the gut talks to the brain. And that's through the vagus nerve. So when they have not so nicely cut the nerve in lab animals, there's no connection. So it's the main messenger. This is the gut wall right here, which we're going to talk about. Really important. So there's a motor connection to the gut from the vagus nerve. And basically, this is how stimulating this nerve again, the auricular branch, comes down. And it actually doesn't just influence the gut, it influences all the organs. And that's through the, the uh, acetylcholine. That's the neurotransmitter that implements that. So gut pathology is linked to brain pathology. Does everybody already know that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that many biodynamic cranial therapists that go to McDonald's every day. <laughs> Maybe there's a couple. I don't know. <laughs> so you know, they've done research and they've shown um, that anxiety and depressive disorders can be linked with autoimmune disease. IBS is linked with anxiety and depression. So there's a coupling of disease with an emotional factor. That's what I'm trying to say. Schizophrenia is often linked with celiac disease. Autism spectrum is linked with gut pathology. Has anybody read about the GAPS diet? gut and psychology syndrome diet. It's, it's a neurologist who, I think her son got diagnosed with autism and she's done a lot of research and put together that information, really good book. But the cool thing is that if this is your gut wall and the pathogens are overgrown, probiotics can actually stop this pathway here and calm everything down, calm down the cortisol, which causes overgrowth, calm that right down, calm down the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it really can help things out. Another key point is that with the germ-free mice, you know, they've, they raised mice without a microbiome and they found that they have too much myelin in their prefrontal cortex if they don't have a biome. So can you think of the implications of that? You know, too much myelin, what does that think? Maybe MS, maybe Parkinson's, maybe issues like that. So myelin irregularities are associated with schizophrenia. schizophrenia. And they were able to reverse this in the, in the mice by giving them probiotics. They ate their sauerkraut. <laughs> so leaky gut is connected to depression. Another fancy word for it is dysbiosis. And here's a brain scan of a depressed person and a brain scan of a not depressed person. It is a physiological phenomena. I mean, we can certainly influence it greatly, 
with our mind-body practices, but it also can be a physiological phenomena that needs lifestyle changes. So here's an intact barrier here. And then here is a leaky gut. Can you see how this is kind of jagged and breaking up? Things are leaking through. OK. These LPS, those are lipopolysaccharides, and they're very toxic. And they're the result of de dead bacteria. Die-off, has anybody heard of a die-off? You know, when you're trying to shift things around. So the bottom line, here's the take home, and that's the leaky gut causes. So these are the things that could be influencing the gut, like the inside of the gut. Organs dysfunctioning, that's the liver. If the liver isn't able to do its job, pathogens, medications. Food particles, toxins, and stress come through, the gut wall gets inflamed. See how it's kind of breaking apart here, it's leaky. Then you start getting food intolerances. All of a sudden, oh, I don't feel so good if I had a carrot, you know. It's not usually a carrot, it's usually <laughs> something else. But, um, and, then, and then that food intolerance can start triggering immune system. So joint pain, right, fatigue, brain fog, um, you know, chronic infections, can't seem to get over colds, things like that. These are the, this is from Dr. Axe. He has a lot of good stuff on his website. Dr. Axe, these are how they affect the body, the adrenals, fatigue, the colon, irregular bowel issues, thyroid. Hashimoto's is basically a version of autoimmune version of hypothyroid, low thyroid, and that can make you feel really tired and depressed. Skin issues, eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, brain, depression, anxiety, you can't focus, sinus issues, chronic sinus stuff, joint pain. I had a patient come in, I don't know, right before I came, and she was a new patient, and she said, oh, I'm just aching all over my body, and, you know, I want to get some body work, and <laughs> I said, how do you feel about changing your diet? Because you kind of have fibromyalgia symptoms, and that's related to your gut, and I explained it to her. I said, I could probably work on your muscles and, you know, do work on your system till the cows come home, but, you know, if your gut is out of balance. And then she started to tell me how she'd been on antibiotics for years as a child, and she had, um, had just been on a whole round of them, so her gut microbiota was wiped out. So hopefully she'll come back. <laughs> So the things that hurt your gut um, are gluten. It's a proven fact. Gluten, and I can explain why, because there's a lot of different research on that that's, that can be contradictory, as usual. So gluten glyphosate, everybody knows that's Roundup? Yeah. Yahoo, Roundup. <laughs> we, we live right next to Monsanto, and it's not, it's like a few towns over, and it's not a good thing. So these things, uh, also these lipopolysaccharides, the die off of the bacteria is quite toxic to your gut wall. So what can happen is these things cause zonulin to go systemic these things. And what zonulin does is it starts to cause leaky gut, leaky brain, affect your kidneys. You know, it can just click on your immune system into quite a not a good space. 
can cross the, you know, affects the, the gut, the blood brain, the vascular, the kidney tubules. So when your nervous system is health, healthy, you have a normal gut physiology and things are working. But when, you're, when you have stress or disease, you can get an imbalance with the brain. And then that goes back and forth between the gut bouncing off each other. So you want to treat both. You want to treat the gut as well as the brain. So it's not that hard um, to treat the gut once you know the basics of it. The zonulin is it's really a big deal because it opens up barriers. And you know, then you can get overgrowth of harmful organisms, bacteria or yeast, small intestinal. Anybody heard of SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth? It's where the bathroom plumbing in your house um, basically backs up into the kitchen. <laughs> Not a good idea, right? <laughs> Sorry to talk about this after lunch. but. <laughs> um, so that's small intestinal bacteria, bacterial overgrowth. And there's many different causes. You know, you should see a naturopath if you have this. This is, this is when you refer to a naturopathic doctor. You can get uh, fungal overgrowth, parasite infections. Um, this is more about gliadin. I'll let you guys read that, but it's stating the connection with the gliadin it's more the gliadin than, you know, like Myrna and I were talking about the, the wheat belly book and how they've disproven that. So they're talking about a different aspect of it, a little bit of a different aspect. He's saying that, you know, they hybrid these plants and made wheat into a completely different plant and then your body doesn't know what it is and reacts to it. This is just more about gliadin, which is what increases the zonulin. So zonulin is related to leaky gut, which is related to Crohn's, diabetes, type 1, which is more juvenile onset, right? Multiple sclerosis, asthma, glioma. I've been seeing a lot more cases, hearing about a lot more cases of glioma. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, EMFs and things like that. Um, inflammatory bowel disease. But there's other things that, you know, influence the gut. It's not just Roundup gliadin. It's also your genetics. You know, fair, your, your gut is much like your skin tone. You know, I'm a fair skin lass. I'm half Irish. And so I have a more sensitive gut than someone who uh, might come from a different genetic background. So what's going on these days? How come things are getting out of balance? Well, there's more. I'm, I don't want to bum you guys out because I feel like we're on the other side. We're trying to shift it. But, you know, I live in the East Coast and I have to explain this to people because they won't believe me otherwise. People are very skeptical in Massachusetts. <laughs> That's why I love the West Coast. I'd probably live here if it wasn't for my family. Um, but what's happened is that MS has gone up, Crohn's disease has gone up. Look how much it's gone up since the 1950s. See how low it is? The percentage. Yeah. So. What's creating this is there's a lot more chemicals that they're using in the environment. There's too much sugar, right? Does everybody know about the sad diet, the standard American diet? <laughs> it's very sad. <laughs> Put tears in your little buckets there. <laughs> um, too many antibiotics, especially young. And we're going to talk a little bit about babies and their guts in, in a minute. C-sections, no breastfeeding, no skin to skin with parents. Those things help build your microbiome. Low fat diets, 
Go out, eat all the fat you want. Get some butter, <laughs> grass-fed butter. Slather it on your vegetables. Amalgam fillings, less and less of that, thankfully. Good old mercury, right? Um, genetically modified foods and poor methylation, which is um, how your body detoxes and a large percentage of the population has trouble with the methylation because they genetically lack, they need a specific type of B vitamin and you have to get it in your diet and if you're not getting it, you don't detox, you don't methylate. Altering the flora in early life can lead to disease. Antibiotics in early life are not so great, so you want to go extra careful out of your way to teach parents about this. And it can create a situation where little ones have allergic asthma. So they did a study on the gut microbiome of mother and baby, and basically this is a baby that's vaginally born and breastfed, and it had one type of microbiome. This is vaginally born and bottle fed, and then C-section. So, of course, this is the best option, right? And I don't know if you've heard of this, Myrna, but with C-sections, um, I've heard of people, I hope it's not too much information, but <laughs> people taking a sterile cotton swab and putting it in mom's vaginal canal and then swabbing it on baby to help rebuild their microbiome after they're born to kind of build the flora. Um, you'd have to explain that very carefully to people <laughs> in a very... <laughs> doing this and they find it can increase the microbiome in the baby by another third. Wow. And wow. lots of mothers are just, you know, not in these research studies if they know about it, just actually putting their hands in their vagina mm -hmm. and smearing that on their baby's face, tongue, and skin if they end up having a cesarean. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's more like their mother's microbiome instead of a whole different microbiome, which hospital microbiome. Yikes. <laughs> so here's a, a healthy gut lining. See how the it's like your teeth. They're nice and tight here. And then here's a compromised gut lining. I don't know if you can see this because it's kind of light out, but, and there's inflammation. So once again, stress really affects the lining of the gut. So don't have any stress on you. Just <laughs> go to, what is it, Oso uh, Caliente and <laughs> hang out there the rest of your life. <laughs> I went there yesterday, it was great. So antibiotics, um, what they found is when they're given to kids the first six months of their life, they're more apt to become overweight. Even if their mom is, is normal size, or not normal, that's not a good word, um, whatever, average. Here's another interesting thing about um, low fat diets and statin drugs increasing dementia. Has anybody noticed an increase in dementia? There is an increase in dementia. So what's happened since 1980, the biggest change is that they're correlating low-fat diet and statin drugs to lower cholesterol. Interesting, huh? So it's affected, it's raised rates of dementia quite a bit. Fats are good. It just depends on which ones, but Fats are your friends, good fats. This explains, you know, I've talked to people about Roundup. Um, I have a neighbor that, 
you know, spraying the whole yard back and forth, you know, and I went over to him and I said, what do you, what is this, what are you spraying, you know? And uh, he says, I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, they're valuing no weeds over our health. It's redunculous, I'm sorry. It's just like, come on, weeds are okay, you know? All the herbalists in the house, they can explain that, but. So this is a really important point to bring up with people about why not to eat GMO foods. And that is because there's this thing, I love this word, the shikimate pathway. So the shikimate pathway is a plant pathway. And the shikimate pathway is not a pathway that we use, but it's a pathway that our microbiome uses. So our little friends, it's hurting our little friends because it cuts it off. Here's glyphosate. It cuts it off right here. And then there's no chlorosomate. And look at the amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. Those don't get made. So the plant can't survive. Tyrosine, for us, when we get the tyrosine made by the microbiome, it makes dopamine, the rewards neurotransmitter. Tryptophan makes serotonin. Phenylalanine makes tyrosine. Tyrosine makes dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine. Those are catecholamines. There's different bacteria that make tryptophan. These are the ones that make those things. E. coli makes chlorosomate, which makes all three, right? No amino acid, no amino acids, the biome dies. Not good, right? Frankenstein. This is, I'm sorry, but I had to put this picture up. Um, this is an MIT professor, Dr. Stephanie Seneff. She's done a lot of research, and she says at today's rate, by 2025, one in two will be autistic, and she thinks it's very connected to GMOs. Unless you live in Nelson. If you live in Nelson, you're fine, because that's Shangri-La. They don't have, do they have glyphosate there? Yeah. They do. Yeah. But Darn it. Probably fewer people yeah. But it's on the shelves. Yeah. Here are these poor rats that were fed a diet of um, genetically modified food. And they got tumors. I don't know why that research is being suppressed, but it is. These, you don't need to know this, but basically I just want you to know what these different you know, what serotonin does and high serotonin and low serotonin. These are things that your gut makes. So it kind of just gives you a nice overview of what they do. Methylation is that liver process that I was talking about. And these, you know, I would suggest that people start thinking about methylating more with what's happening in the envir environment and start working with methylation to, but you have to have your gut in good shape before you start methylating or else it's really a waste of time. But uh, methylation vitamins preserve gray matter. The two methylation vitamins, the big ones are B9, which is folic acid, and B12, which is cobalamin. So they've done studies and this shows the difference between a placebo and a person with a brain most of us have brains, uh, given <laughs> B vitamins. Here is a, another mousey that was um, a pregnant mouse was given a diet with rich methyl groups. And this one, and she's got three healthy mice here. And here she was given regular mouse food probably with GMOs and things like that. Not as healthy. Also, they found that 
this mouse mouse was given um, also these are the methylation vitamins the primary ones but phytoestrogen also helped protect the the um, offspring so toxins can increase dementia and degeneration and create cognitive impairment I just I really wanted to make this do this lecture because you know people are coming in with all kinds of issues and we're cranial therapists we're working with brains the nervous system so it's really good to know this stuff so if you feel like someone really isn't improving and you've been working with them and they're shifting things, you know, it's good to know about this part piece, you know, whether you want to do the work yourself or refer, it's really important to know about this piece. The thing about methylation is that it helps clear homocysteine and homocysteine causes a lot of inflammation in the body. So homocysteine levels significantly correlated with cognitive function, dementia, markers of neurodegeneration, and Parkinson's disease patients. So here's some more facts. Um, the gut bacteria given to a germ-free mouse from a heavy mouse made the germ-free mouse heavy. Isn't that interesting? So our parents uh, microbiome really influenced our microbiome quite a lot. Mice raised in a germ-free environment, when given specific bacteria, it can change their behavior. You can really see this in kids or animals. It's very clear. Low serotonin and high dopamine is a recipe for violence and aggression. I mean, it's just like a a fact. Stress hormones cause rapid growth of E. coli four times. Bacteria, this is an interesting one, bacteria steal iron to grow rapidly and can cause iron deficient anemia. Isn't that interesting? So if you have someone who has um, anemia and they haven't figured out what's causing it, then it could be that their biome is overgrowing too fast and just stealing all their iron. Adrenaline increases biofilm. So biofilm is kind of like what slugs move in. It's like this goop, and that's what the bacteria like to live in. <laughs> Bad bugs, here's a good one, Bad bugs eat sugar and refined carbs. And they talk to us when we drive by the donut shop. <laughs> Say, please, please stop and have a donut. <laughs> a couple of donuts aren't bad, but it's just once you start doing it every day, then it's, it's not so good. Antibiotics, everybody knows this, I'm sure, kill good bacteria as well as bad. So they just throw off the balance in the gut. 25% of women from 40 to 60 years old are on antidepressants. Isn't that interesting? Maybe they should work on their gut biome instead. Interesting, and get some craniosacral therapy. So to wrap this up, we've learned a few things. Brain health depends on a healthy gut environment. The two go hand in hand. Many symptoms we experience in our heads are also due to problems in our gut. Modern lifestyle and medical practice have really harmed our microbiome, so you have to be mindful of that. GMO foods interfere with our gut bacteria's ability to produce neurotransmitters. Inflammation from leaky gut destroys serotonin. It can lead to insomnia, pain, anxiety, worry, stress. And too many antibiotics, poor stomach function, lack of gut motility can create this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Does everybody know what GABA is? 
makes you feel nice and calm. It kind of quiets down the midbrain and the, the dragon brain, as Rebecca said today. So it's an amino acid that acts as a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. So it calms nervous activity. There's a probiotic called lactobacillus, and it supports lowering anxiety by supporting GABA. Isn't that interesting? They're our little friends. <laughs> our little helpers. How can, we, how can we support this? This would be great to just hand to your clients, you know, if they don't already know. A lot of our, a lot of our clients already know this, but if they don't already know, probiotics lower anxiety. Increase learning, and that's another line. I didn't, I missed the bullet there, but they lower, lower your stress level. We can lower our stress level with our work and a mind-body practice that really supports the gut-brain axis quite a bit. Eating fermented food is good if you, if you don't have histamine issues. Taking probiotics, prebiotics are basically digestive enzymes. And it's good to switch brands around so you're getting different types of flora building. Eat whole, unrefined foods. I think the, the, the simpler you eat, the better it is. The less fancy stuff you eat, it's just better if it's really basic. Boy, did I want those biscuits the other day with the gravy or whatever. Those, that was my microbiome calling out. <laughs> I'd love biscuits, but I just had two bites. Grass-fed meat, free-range organic poultry, stuff like that. Um, bone broth is a really good thing to do to help support your gut microbiome. It really helps heal the gut walls. Eating fiber to feed the healthy bacteria from these different things. Interesting, it was like cold rice and cold potatoes that were cooked. That's what they like. <laughs> what do you want for dinner? <laughs> so that's what the bacteria like, the good bacteria like these things. Yeah, it's interesting. Too much alcohol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil, you know, things like that. Uh, what's the other one? Hylenol, acetyl, yeah, all that stuff. Um, stress, sleep loss, low-carb diets are kind of, you know, not low-carb, low-refined. I should have put refined carb diets because it's really good just to eat a ton of vegetables and fruits if you don't have blood sugar issues. Everybody's different, you know, everybody has a different epigenetics, so it's just good to see how you feel on different diets. See a natural health doctor is a really good idea to, to work with this if there's an issue. What I do in my practice is I muscle test a lot. I do applied kinesiology, so I'll actually muscle test for food sensitivities and then have the person, and then I test their organ points energetically and then have them avoid the foods for two weeks and I retest the organ points, and they're all better. And they don't have to take any supplements. So it's, you know, sometimes I get a lot of whining about it, but, you know, when they can see they don't have a liver reflex, they don't have a, you know, toxin reflex, then it, it kind of shows them the difference. So, uh, there's a holistic kinesiology place in this state in Albuquerque that trains people, and it's really great. Lacto, uh, what bacteria produce which neurotransmitter? So lactobacillus, you could pick from a menu. Which neurotransmitter would I like to build today? GABA, acetylcholine, I have to f focus and function. Uh, norepinephrine. You know, do I want to be sharp, candida, serotonin? Do I want to feel happy and calm? Do I want to get rewarded? You know, 
It's very interesting. It's very, they've really, the research has really gotten very specific. You want to have all of them. And then this is the last slide, which I thought was really pertinent for us, is that here is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is basically, this is neurological function here. So as you go down, the neurological function gets worse. So here is a person with a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with a concussion. You see how the neurological function drops? Here is a person with um, no concussion. That's the triangle, but just SIBO. Let's see. SIBO without a concussion is the triangle. The neurological function drops with SIBO alone, no concussion. And here is a person just with a concussion. The circles, the neurological function is pretty good. Isn't that wild? So if you have a person that you're treating that has declining neurological function and they've sent them to their neurologist and they're not finding anything, happens all the time. The testing is not sensitive enough, really. It's not functional, right? It's disease testing. You might want to look at this. Look at their gut and see if there's something going on there. OK, so I thought I could just show, like do a little demo. You want to volunteer? Um, so come on over. I'm just going to hold your feet. Is that all right? OK. And you could ask people, too, say, how's your digestion? Not as good on this food as it is when I'm at home. Yeah. I concur. Yeah, so I'm just tuning in. And you know, I, I would recommend, you know, if you want to try this, um, you could listen to the gut, which Mimi is saying, come to my gut, please. <laughs> or you could, you could listen from the vagus nerve. You get to choose whatever you'd like to do. And then what I would do is nothing, because that's what we do, right? Nothing. <laughs> that's my joke. <laughs> um, would it be OK to put one hand under your, your back? And then, you know, when you're, you're settling, remember that it's, it's, a, it's a community. There's a community that we're working with. So you may want to listen to that community as well as Mimi, you know, because they're all together. They're not, they're not, it's like splitting hairs. You can't separate, but but maybe just give space to the community, the biome. How would it be to contact your stomach, Great. your gut? So I just, I like to start up here because it's just old habit. Just settle in and see what her system shows you. It's good to know the anatomy, like um, Christopher was saying. Christopher Mueller, where are you? Back here. It's good to know the anatomy because that is how the body speaks. That's the language. It's like. You don't want to go to Italy without knowing some Italian, right? So same thing with human beings. <laughs> you want to speak, speak their language. Can I share what I'm noticing? Do you want to share what you're noticing? You go first. So I'm just noticing 
Some congestion like right around the right ascending colon, sort of in the lower right quadrant. And just kind of a, what did you feed me? <laughs> They're saying, what did you feed me today? <laughs> um, yeah. What are you noticing, if anything? Um, as we're settling, I'm noticing how my back body is finding the table and how muscle groups that have been holding are starting to soften. Mm -hmm. In terms of the gut, I'm aware of, um, I guess I was feeling it more like heat or stagnation, but mm -hmm. same area that you were. Mm -hmm. Also really noticing my liver. Yep. Um, I'm thinking about the in breath, out breath. <laughs> mm -hmm. So nice. So what what we would do if you wanted to listen in this way would just be to um, see what's happening with motility. You know, see what's happening. Is the is the gut working as a unified field? Is it working? You know, it can happen as one part can be working and the other parts not in the large intestine. And they can have like a sibling rivalry where one's doing this thing and the other's doing that thing. And let's see if you can, with your intention, just bring in, you know, just check in with motility. And something just shifted there. If all my clients were like you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's, oh, wow. It's just like breathing right through the whole gorgeous. Nice, there's some titration happening and lovely. I think even just taking time to have that reflection of a hand on your belly and a hand on your back so you can feel the wholeness, right? I think sometimes we get caught in the sense of just the front body or just the back body and really feeling that relational connection in the whole universe of it mm -hmm. starts a conversation and softening. Nice. So we could go on for another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> we will later. We will. Down in the pavilion. So um, would anybody like me to show the auricular branch of the vagus nerve? Would that be helpful? Would that be okay if I moved? Sure. Yeah. I'm just going to move this hand. Okay. I like what you were saying about the um, singing in the shower thing. Yeah. Because sometimes when I'm getting work, I'll have this sort of instinct to tone. Uh huh. <laughs> Which is just fun. Yeah. That's a great idea. I mean, even in your, in your mind's eye, because your brain, the way it's wired is, if you think about playing the piano, your brain is playing the piano. So you could even stealth it in with your clients where you're humming your own money pod may home or whatever you like to do while you're working. Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> not out loud. Just <laughs> not New England. <laughs> so um, there's, remember the old contacts? There's two for the ear, right? So we could do the, okay, if I make contact. Yeah. The mastoid here. 
And this would be great with uh, what the Mueller's were lecturing on today too. And then the external auditory meatus, and then the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So right now we're just holding the temporals with lots of space. And right where that middle finger is, is right near the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Yeah, it's titrating. Can you feel that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. If I had an office here, <laughs> just looking out the window. <laughs> wow. It's beautiful here. Yeah. So you can tap into the social nervous system here too, because the trigeminal nerve is, remember the Meckles pocket that they were talking about? Yeah, you're in relationship with that and the tentorium. The facial nerve has a branch too that goes through here. Through a little teeny foramen called the foramen spinosum. The back of the, uh, right near the mastoid process. She's fun to work on, I tell you. <laughs> the vagus nerve comes down right behind the ear, doesn't it? It actually is in the, the, the tear bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would it be okay to s switch contacts? If you have to. I know. <laughs> so another way is to hold the tear buckets. <coughs> nice handles, right? Can everybody grab their ear right here? That's your vagus nerve. I don't know if there's any acupuncturists in the house, but you know, they do a lot of ear points. I think there's a connection. I think they know about this way before we ever did. So you, this is more specific to the vagus nerve. But, you know, it's a good way to connect with the tent. It's an old upledger hold, I think. Mm -hmm. So you could try those if you wanted and see what arises. Or you could just do a, a session like we always do at work and just see what arises. Uh, the gut makes vitamin K, and vitamin K is really important to help you absorb its clotting factors, absorbing calcium, and things like that. So the gut makes some of the nutrition that we need. Some people take K2, I take it, because um, it helps me absorb vitamin D and calcium better. Yes. There's uh, ones that are called um <laughs> that are soil based, and those are pretty tough. Um, they get through the gut, the upper gut, easier through the H, the hydrochloric acid, and survive that easier. And those are helpful. There's a company called Prescript Assist that sells those, and they're very, that's what I took after I had Lyme bite. Um, I had like a mini Lyme situation, so I took the doxycycline, and then I was taking that for, I took it for like six months. Can you repeat the name of that? It's called Prescript Assist. They have some that need to be refrigerated. They have some that don't. The other thing is just to eat fermented food. Pickles, sauerkraut, kombucha. Um, yeah. What's that? I'm sorry? The kinds that aren't treated. 
Yeah. They have to be more Yeah. That's right. Lots of lots of different ways. You want to include them in your diet, though. Yeah. You said something about unless you have histamine something. Yeah, some people have histamine intolerance. If they have, um, you can have this. This is a whole other thing, but you can have a genetic mutation called MAO. And if you have that heterozygous or homozygous, you can find out on 23andMe. Then oftentimes you have histamine issues. Also, if you have a DAO mutation, you can have issues with histamine. And then you do not feel well on fermented foods. So you have to take probiotics then. Of course, yogurt, but you know, not everybody can handle dairy, so yogurt's tricky. So why don't we transition to the other building? You want to take over? I just, a quick 